Joseph Smith Jr., the founder of the worldwide religion known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Many know them by their newly disassociated nickname, the Mormons. The Latter-day Saints have a long-told history of their prophet, the seer. But where did Joseph Smith, the seer, receive this title? And what exactly is a seer? Some say the boy prophet was visited by an ancient Native American angel named Moroni, and that he was also visited by God the Father and Jesus Christ himself, giving Joseph divine seership to God's will and power through a seer stone to bind on earth and in heaven, that he used a set of seer stones to translate the gold plates. There are many critical of Smith's truth claims, and they believe he was a practitioner of the occult sciences, that he learned to use occult practices to gain knowledge from another realm, or possibly use the occult sciences as a way to mislead others, and feeling inspired by God to do so, as long as it brought others closer to Christ. So one question we explore in this short film, was Joseph Smith Jr. a divine seer called of God? Or was he a practitioner of the occult sciences intended to mislead people? Or was it a combination of the two? Join us as we discover the history of Joseph Smith and his role as a seer behind the religion he founded. Why has this topic become top of mind for so many church members? It's interesting to note that the LDS Church for the first time in 185 years released pictures of the seer stone that Joseph Smith used not only for translating the gold plates, but it's also one of the seer stones he used for treasure scrying. They are one in the same. The volume also includes photos of a seer stone, which is believed to have been used by Joseph Smith in his translation of the Book of Mormon, which the LDS Church says it has possessed since the 1870s. Joseph Smith had it originally, then it went to Oliver Cowdery, from him to his widow, and from his widow to Phineas Young, who was the brother of Brigham Young. Phineas gave it to Brigham and then Brigham kept it during the rest of his life. Church historians say, well, photos of the stone are being published for the first time. We felt that in order to connect a very visual uprising generation to the past, it was good to include pictures. The seer stone will not become part of a public display. Because it's a sacred object, we had to decide how to balance showing appropriate reverence on the one hand, and on the other hand, making it available so that people could see it. We decided that a color photograph would be a good way of making it available. Since the release of the Seer Stone's photos, the church has produced multiple videos explaining why Joseph Smith used his own Seer Stone to translate the Book of Mormon in conjunction with the Urim and Thummim. Many members found it odd and somewhat problematic that after Martin Harris lost the 116 pages of the Book of Mormon and after Moroni returned the interpreters to Joseph Smith that Joseph decided to set aside the 2,000-year-old God-given interpreters that were preserved for the very purpose of translating the gold plates so that he could instead use his own childhood seer stone to translate the golden plates. The details of this are briefly covered in this video released by the church in March of 2018. Let's watch that now. Plates out on the table, but that's not really the best match for what we know about the translation process. What do the historical sources from those involved around the time tell us about the translation process? Well, first of all, Joseph Smith explained that he translated the Book of Mormon through the medium of the Urim and Thummim by the gift and power of God, but he didn't explain further than that. 
So what about the seer stone, for instance? What, what was its involvement in the translation process? So Emma Smith, Joseph Smith's wife, and Martin Harris, his friend, and David Whitmer, his friend, who were around during the time of the translation of the Book of Mormon, said that he used a seer stone to translate parts of the Book of Mormon as well as the Urim and Thummim. And Martin Harris explained that Joseph Smith started using the seer stone instead of the Urim and Thummim for convenience. Wait, so what might that mean for convenience? Well, that's a really good question. We're not really sure what that means, but if you think of the Urim and Thummim, the descriptions that are given of the Urim and Thummim, it's described as two clear stones in a rim like glasses. And the Book of Mormon says that these stones are what constitute seers. Having the, and using these stones are what constitute seers. So the Urim and Thummim actually is this special pair of seer stones. And we have these descriptions of the Urim and Thummim connected to the breastplate and that they're large and that they don't fit on Joseph Smith's face. And we even have accounts that he takes the lenses out of the rim and puts them in a hat, which is the way he used a seer stone. So if he uses his own seer stone rather than the Urim and Thummim, he can put the Urim and Thummim in the breastplate away somewhere safe and just use his seer stone. And that's more convenient. Okay, that makes sense, but it also sounds a little bit strange to then think of it as Joseph Smith looking at a stone in a hat. Yeah, that's an image that we're familiar with, but actually it's not that strange. He's just trying to block out light. That's the point. So it's like on a really sunny day, if you get a text message and you pull out your cell phone and you can't see it because of the sun and you make shade, you block out the light so you can see what it says. It's the same kind of idea. So in the stone, he sees the translation in light and he puts his face in the hat so he can block out light and see what's on the seer stone. Can you make the Book of Mormon translation process visual for me for a moment? If I were an artist and to come to you and say, hey, I wanna do a depiction of the translation that's more accurate, how should I make that look? Well, we would actually need two different images. We would need one depiction where Joseph Smith is wearing the breastplate that was connected to the Urim and Thummim, and he's looking through the Urim and Thummim, and he could be looking at the plates. And then we also need the other image where Joseph Smith is with a hat, looking into the hat at a seer stone. The Book of Mormon wasn't just translated in one way. It was translated in different ways at different times. So the seer stone was integral to the translation of the Book of Mormon, but for some people it's still a little bit uncomfortable to think about that seer stone. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. I'm not sure exactly why that is. I think a big part of it is just that when Joseph Smith wrote about this in 1838, he talked about the Urim and Thummim spectacles that he found with the golden plates, and he didn't write about the seer stone. And that history became canonized as part of the Pearl Great Price, and that is what Latter-day Saints are familiar with. And we have much less familiarity with other sources that talk about a seer stone. I think that's part of it. It may be that we want things that are miraculous to be ancient, like the Urim and Thummim in the Bible. It may be that a seer stone is too much like an ordinary rock. It's something mundane. But the idea of Joseph Smith using a seer stone to translate, this is an idea that we can get used to. We believe in modern miracles. English traditions and practices of treasure digging crossed the Atlantic and by the late 1700s were thriving in America. During the period Joseph Smith's family lived in Vermont, the state was something of a treasure digging mecca. In Pennsylvania, the belief in ghosts or spooks, as they were often called, was general, and wherever any treasure or ill-gotten gain was concealed, it was believed that the spirit of the perpetrator would guard it ever after. Several generations of the Smith family were influenced by the magic worldview before the 1800s. During the Salem witchcraft trials of 1692, the deposition of Samuel Smith 
and Boxford, about 25 years of age, accused Mary Etsy of committing acts of witchcraft at Topsfield five years earlier. The deposition of John Gold, aged about 56 years or thereabout, accused Sarah Wilds of acts of witchcraft 15 years before the trial. These accusers were Joseph Sr.'s great-grandfather, Samuel, who was actually 26 years old at the time, and Samuel's father-in-law, John Gold, actually 57 years old at the time. The two women were hanged as witches at Salem on the basis of the accusations by Smith's ancestors. After the Salem trials, other generations of his ancestors resided in areas noted for beliefs and practices of folk magic and alchemy. Bayet Lapham traveled to Manchester in 1830 to learn about Mormon claims directly from the Smiths. He spoke at length with the prophet's father and later wrote, This Joseph Smith, Sr., we soon learned from his own lips, was a firm believer in witchcraft and other supernatural things and had brought up his family in the same belief. In fact, Joseph Jr. continued to express his belief in witches as the LDS church president. In three separate interviews, Orlando Brothers Lorenzo Saunders said he observed a folk magic activity of Joseph Smith Sr. At turkey shoots, Joseph Sr. pretended to enchant their guns so that they could not kill a turkey. Asked, how would he do that? Lorenzo replied, he would blow in the gun and fill around the lock and then tell them it was charmed and they could not kill the turkey. So where did Joseph Smith's family learn about the occult? Some point to the teachings of what you find in the Magnus and also in the writings of John Dee. In the 1500s, an occult philosopher by the name of John Dee came to the scene and became an advisor to Queen Elizabeth. John Dee was the embodiment of the ideal of an enlightened being who had the uh, spiritual understanding of his role and mission in life and who was gifted with, you know, superior intelligence. Despite his work in alchemy, Dee's true occult passion lay in divination. He believed he could use scientific methods to communicate with supernatural beings. John Dee used a divination method known as scrying and would use a crystal ball or seer stone that would reflect back supernatural information. Scrying is a long time old technique, scrying into glasses, mirrors, bodies of water, anything that would have a reflective surface. Uh, and see if you could see not just the material things, but the spiritual things standing behind. These efforts were unsuccessful until one day a young man named Edward Kelly appeared at his door. Kelly seemed to have the talent to see into the shadow world. Their system involved Edward Kelly looking into a amethyst crystal and describing what he saw, and John Dee would then record these uh, communications. Kelly began to receive messages from the angels. They spoke in a language called Enochian from the lost biblical book of Enoch. These transmissions are early examples of what Joseph Smith would call channeling. What Dee and Kelly brought forth was completely new. It was not based on tradition. He appeared to be speaking a new language. The Enochian language does appear to have a coherent vocabulary and syntax, and this doesn't seem like the sort of thing that Kelly, who was not a particularly educated or schooled person, could have just invented. He couldn't have faked something like that. Dee's main legacy is not to science, it is to magic. And it's because of those who have come after, who have seized upon what he created and made it into a new worldview, whether it's consciousness arts or ceremonial magic or divination, could take place inside these new parameters that they set up. Like John Dee and Edward Kelly, Joseph Smith 
the founding prophet and president of the new church, had unquestionably participated in stone divination. Evidence indicates that he also used divining rods, a talisman, and implements of ritual magic. His father, one of the eight witnesses to the divinity of the Book of Mormon, and later the church patriarch, had also participated in divining and the quest for treasure. His older brother Hiram, one of the eight witnesses, and a member of the First Presidency and Church Patriarch after their father's death, had also participated in the treasure quest and was custodian of the family's implements of ritual magic at his own death. His younger brother Samuel and William, one of the eight witnesses and one of the original twelve apostles, accepted their brother's stone divination and apparently joined some of Joseph's treasure expeditions. Understandably, they found nothing objectionable in other folk magic practices of their father and brothers. The three witnesses to the Book of Mormon were likewise involved in folk magic. Oliver Cowdery was a rodsman before his 1829 meeting with Smith, who soon announced a revelation authorizing Cowdery to continue the revelatory use of his rod of nature. David Whitmer revered Smith's use of a seer stone and may have possessed one of his own. Whitmer authorized a later spokesman for his own religious organization to obtain revelations through a stone. Martin Harris endorsed Smith's use of a seer stone for divination and treasure seeking before and after the discovery of the gold plates. Harris himself participated in treasure digging and identified the Smiths brothers, Joseph and Hiram, as co-participants. Of the remaining eight witnesses, Jacob Whitmer had a seer stone which his descendants preserved. His brother-in-law Hiram Page definitely had a stone of his own that he used for revelations. Kristen, John, and Peter Whitmer Jr. were included in their pastor's accusation of magic belief. Magic belief and practice also influenced the first quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1835. Half of them gave specific evidence of a belief in various practices of folk magic. This includes Apostles Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, Luke Johnson, Orson Pratt, and John Bonton. In addition, William Smith, Parley P. Pratt, and Lehman E. Johnson express no known dissent against these views and practices of their brothers. Thus, two-thirds of Mormonism's first apostles had some affinity for folk magic. Because of the verified presence of folk believers among the founders of Mormonism, magic in the occult exercised considerable influence among the first generation of Mormon converts from New York and New England. This was especially true for those who converted before 1831. Many of the earliest Mormons, including Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, Orrin P. Rockwell, Joseph Knight, and Josiah Stoll, were rodsmen or money diggers, but became Mormons for religious reasons. In Palmyra, several of Smith's neighbors had seer stones. Until the Book of Mormon thrust Joseph into prominence, Palmyra's most notable seer was Sally Chase, who used a greenish colored stone. Her school friends said, She told me she would place the stone in a hat and hold it to her face and claim things would be brought to her view. William Stafford also had a seer stone, and Joshua Stafford had a peep stone which looked like a white marble and had a hole through the center. The hole allowed Stafford's peep stone to double as an amulet. Both the Chase and Stafford families used their stones for treasure digging around Palmyra. Joseph Knight described Samuel Lawrence as a fourth non-Mormon seer at Palmyra. Martin Harris and another Palmyra neighbor also described Lawrence as participating in local treasure digging with the Smith family. Joseph Smith acquired three seer stones as a teenager. From a combination of friendly and unfriendly sources, it is clear that Joseph Smith, as a teenager, acquired three different seer stones. He obtained the first by digging for it himself 
after seeing its location in a stone he had borrowed from a neighbor. Someone claimed to give him a second stone. He used most extensively a third stone obtained while he and his brother Alvin were well digging on a neighbor's property in Palmyra. William D. Purple, a non-Mormon, published his reminiscence of acting as a scribe for an 1826 court case during which he heard Joseph Jr. describe finding his first stone. He said when he was a lad, he heard of a neighborhood girl, Sally Chase, some three miles from him, who could look into a glass and see anything, however hidden from others, that he was seized with a strong desire to see her and her glass, that after much effort he induced his parents to let him visit her. He did so and was permitted to look in the glass, which was placed in a hat to exclude the light. He was greatly surprised to see but one thing, which was a small stone a great way off. It became luminous and dazzled his eyes, and after a short time it became as intense as the midday sun. He said that the stone was under the roots of the tree and shrub as large as his arm. He borrowed an old axe and hoe and repaired to the tree. With some labor and exertion, he found the stone. In this interview with Lapham, Joseph Sr. also said his son saw the location of the stone in the earth by looking at someone else's stone. His father said Joseph Jr. acquired his first seer stone at about 14 years of age. In other words, about 1819 to 1820, around the age of the first vision. Cousins of Joseph Smith's wife, Emma Hell, explain how their relatives became involved in the treasure quest with Harper and Smith. Quote, According to our recollection, the starting point of the money digging speculation in our vicinity in which Joseph Smith Jr. was engaged was as follows. A man by the name of William Hell, a distant relative of our uncle Isaac Hell, came to Isaac Hell and said that he had been informed by a woman named Oldley who claimed to possess the power of seeing underground. Such persons were then commonly called peepers, that there was great treasure concealed in the hill northeast from his, Isaac Hell's house, in Harmony's Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. By her direction, William Hell commenced digging, but being too lazy to work and too poor to hire, he obtained a partner by the name of Oliver Harper of New York State who had the means to hire help. But after a short time, operations were suspended for a time. During the suspension, William Hell heard of Peeper Joseph Smith Jr. He wrote to him and soon visited him. He found Smith's representations were so flattering that Smith was either hired or became a partner with William Hell, Oliver Harper, and a man by the name of Stoll who had some property. This referred to Josiah Stoll, a resident of Bainbridge, Chenango County, New York, adjacent to Broome County, both north of Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. Joseph Smith's mother said it was Harper's pre-1824 partner, Stoll, who came for Joseph on the account of having heard that he possessed certain keys, by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye. Joseph Smith used a divining rod in addition to his seer stone, according to Mrs. David Lyons, it was in 1825 when the digging was renewed after Harper's death, and Joe himself was present in Harmony, Pennsylvania. In his interview with Fayette Lapham, Joseph Sr. said his son, Joseph, went to the town of Harmony in the state of Pennsylvania at the request of someone who wanted the assistance of his divining rod and stone in finding hidden treasure. This indicates that Joseph Jr. still used a divining rod as late as the fall of 1825, years after the first vision. So what is a divining rod. The whole concept of divining means trying to understand the will of the gods. And in order to understand the will of the gods, you have to have something to read about them, something that you see they're doing. The Babylonians used one of the occult's oldest arts to understand their world, divination, or accessing the supernatural. 
The movements of the planets through the heavens used to be considered the footprints of the gods and goddesses. And when they would catch up with each other and have interactions, or one would go retrograde and then go forward again, these things were all uh, understood to affect the world. Certain people who were uh, distinguishable by early man as having sort of mystical experiences, and these would be the religious representatives of the clan. These people would have been communicating in, in ways of imagination to kind of talk to the gods or talk to the spirits or um, uh, affect certain things that would happen. In Egypt, divination developed into a sophisticated system of rituals and ceremonies designed to contact the gods who ruled their world. Yeah, of course, you were trying to influence uh, things like your success in business or the crops. The Egyptians used rituals, they used incantations, they used the symbols to convey the, all of those things. The pharaoh himself was the head of their religion, so that he was probably the chief practitioner of both their religion and their magic. Based on everything we have learned about Joseph Smith's occult practices and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, by way of the seer stone, then the idea that Joseph Smith used the seer stone as training wheels for revelations is invalid. As we learn from LDS researcher and seer stone gospel topic contributor Michael Hubbard McKay, that this theory is invalid. Um, and it only introduces this concept. And that is saying if those rocks are part of our religious system, we believe that Joseph Smith saw words in the rock. I don't, I don't care how you think he did, whether it was in his mind or they actually appeared across the rock, this becomes part of our religious understanding of Mormonism. Assuming that, you then have to begin to dismiss this overwrought, unbelievably incorrect concept that seer stones were training wheels for Joseph Smith. Um, this, is, this is, number one, the argument just doesn't play out. It doesn't play out in the historical sources. Joseph used a seer stone, but then he realized, oh, that was part of money digging. I'm going to get rid of that and get real revelation that comes like a conduit of light straight to my head. Now, that in itself is problematic. The value of the seer stone, the narrative they give about words appearing on the stones, is apologetic in its very essence. If there's words that appear on the rock, cognizance or, or a Joseph Smith making the decisions of what those words are can't be made by him. They're coming on the rock. He's just reading them. This is in itself an absolute apology from Mormonism. That's what it is. And we've dismissed it as if it's scary. It's... it's it's the orthodox person's very best friend when you're talking about the text of the Book of Mormon. To say esotericism had nothing to do with the translation of the Book of Mormon, well, I think that's a huge mistake. We have mass amounts of records of Joseph Smith being a money digger um, and, and some very engaged practices of esotericism. Just like Joseph Smith or even John Dee and Kelly Andrews, we don't have to look far to find somebody just like them in the 21st century. Some have compared Steve Huff of Huff Paranormal as the Kelly Andrews of our day. Others have even pointed to his unique divination access to the supernatural as relatable to Joseph Smith and his divination of the divine and the revelation of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> My name is Steve Huff, and I connect with and record the voices of the dead. For over 9 years, 800 videos, and nearly 1 million subscribers, I have proven that our soul never dies. 100% real and proven time and again. I am not a ghost hunter, but rather an afterlife researcher. Smell the uh, scent coming from this box here? Yes. I thought I saw a face in the mirror during that session. What do you have to say about this oil? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, that's heating up. 
Oh. Debbie's here. I can hear you. These are just a handful of the thousands of messages I have recorded from the other side. I invite you to join and follow my research, subscribe to this channel, and see all the new videos as I release them weekly. Remember, love is the key. It's working. I know you guys are coming through. Archangel Michael. Mary's dog, Riley. Dog! Dog! What color do you see? Yo. I know you're here. I can hear you. What's your name? Who's here with me tonight? Leading the way in real, instrumental trans communication. Remember, this is only the beginning. Huff seems to have tapped into another realm of spirits, maybe even the spirit world that Joseph Smith and other church leaders call the spirit world, spirit prison, or spirit paradise. Is it possible to suggest that Joseph Smith was a practitioner of the occult sciences, that he came from a family of occultists who relied on Joseph Smith's junior seership abilities to locate treasures and then eventually turn his divination ability into a vine of the divine, accessing God's will with a tip of the hat and a stone inside? Or was it his background, cultural esotericism, and upbringing a byproduct and had nothing to do with his creation of the Book of Mormon and the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? The path of facts could lead you in either direction, and we will leave it up to you to decide. For further research in this topic, we have multiple suggested resources in the notes of this video. Thank you for watching Joseph Smith, The Seer.